desgraciadamente mi condición de mi cuerpo ha sido lastimada por el espíritu del mal pero el poderoso espíritu de verdad me hizo regresar a la tierra porque tengo la misión yo soy de la tribu Yaqui y me hizo regresar a la misión de hablar en todas las re reservaciones. I remember hearing Coronel Guerrero back in 1982. I was a delegate to Tlactocan Iscalot from El Paso, Texas, and it was expected that the Coronel would be there. But because of his failing health, he was unable to attend. Instead, he sent us a recorded message. And I remember it was a very powerful message. He told us many things. He said that in the next few years, the dead would rise. And that in the sacred temples that had been uh, asleep or dormant for hundreds of years, would come to life again. He told us that the spirit of truth had designated a place for the liberty of Indian peoples to be born. That place was called Aztlan, which he referred to as paradise. His voice was very weak and frail, and it was obvious that he was uh, in very bad health. But his words were very powerful, and they inspired us all at that meeting. Pero, él les habla y les dice, hay un lugar que el Espíritu de verdad tiene preparado para que sea allí donde nazca la libertad del indio, de todas las tribus de los indios, que se llama Aztlán. Aztlán quiere decir la gloria, que es donde vive el Espíritu de verdad. En uh, was in uh, 1971, I had the opportunity to meet the uh, Rafael Guerrero, oh, we have, uh, it's been called the uh, Coronel. And in those years, we uh, come to, uh, to the point of uh, thinking of this elderly man, that he was, became my teacher. To that point of uh, many, many years, we we understand these uh, uh, ways of uh, ways of a life, and you come to the point in the uh, in, in the years of the early 1980s where he uh, endorsed what uh, we were doing as young people to the point of where he became our honorary elder for our Chicano nation. And I'm very happy to have had the uh, opportunity in my lifetime to have uh, been uh, instructed by this uh, elderly, respected uh, teacher. And many people didn't know him that way, but uh, I was one of the fortunate that had the opportunity to work along with him. So the things that uh, didn't uh, understand, and even in the beginnings, was the uh, with the uh, truth, all in those years that I had met him, I seemed like I was just uh, living my life uh, blindly, uh, just um, with no uh, real direction. But somehow he must have seen that uh, there was a there was the uh, a chance for a man who could be lost, who could be later find himself and find himself in relationship to the truth. So all those years, it even seemed like he wasn't there. He was always waiting for me to make my change and he always supported me. Me and my family always uh, took care of us that way. I think what the Coronel was trying to say 
is come to terms with yourselves as a people. Look at your history and don't live that lie that you've been living for nearly 500 years. The lie that somehow we are half European and half Indian. It's true that we are a people of many bloods, but they are the blood of the many native nations that populated Mexico and that were driven together into the slave camps of the Spaniards. There was no grand marriage on this continent. Whatever blood we have from the Spaniards came about by rape, not by marriage. It's a hard thing to say and it's a hard thing to come to terms with, but it's true. We have to realize that we were invaded by a foreign power and subjected to the most inhumane conditions imaginable. Our people were placed in slave camps, our women were abused, our land was taken away from us. Everything that we regarded as sacred was uh, just destroyed or removed from our control. It was Dia de los Muertos, 1983. My husband and I were driving past 16th Street in Moreland in Phoenix. At that time, the archaeologists were out digging the remains of the Holcomb. We felt really bad because it was Dia de los Muertos and this is a day our ancestors worshipped the dead. And here the archaeologists were digging up the remains of our ancestors. We felt something should be done at that time. In spring of the following year, we had a four-day ceremony held at that site. By that time, the archaeologists were gone, and the groundwork was, be laid, was being laid for a new freeway. At that time, we had four days of talk, of sweat lodge ceremonies, of Aztec dance, and we picked our spring ceremony queen. The, the ceremony was attended by members of different Southwest tribes and a Southwest Alliance was formed at that time. It was called Anasazi, which stood for American Nation Sovereign Aslan Indígena. From this experience I learned that the Holcomb never left this land, that they are us and we are still here. My name is Tupac Enrique. In 1987, I was sent to Geneva, Switzerland to the United Nations Human Rights Commission, the 43rd annual meeting. I was sent by the Tocan Tiscado as a representative. During that commission, we were the commission proceedings that lasted five weeks. We participated on an equal basis with some of the 99 other Indian nations sitting there with as Chicanos along with these other Indian nations in a brotherhood on the international level to address some of the common problems that affect us as Indian people, indigenous people throughout uh, the hemisphere. And it was, it was very educational, it was very, very enlightening to see how uh, after 500 years the system had been able to uh, control us to the extent that, that uh, we find our nations under, under the situation of uh, being colonized still by European, mainly European interests. Coming back from Geneva was once again uh, re-emphasized uh, the need that I saw I think that most of us are beginning to see more uh, the need for Chicanos to get together from uh, international, looking at themselves from an international indigenous perspective because of the experiences that we've been through, the communication uh, point that we're at being Spanish and English speakers for the most part and the role that we could play in that area and uh, especially our situation, our location geographically, the importance of it being here in Aztlan. I think that uh, the Geneva trip 
since it was a, a historical thing in the sense it was we were the first three Chicanos to go in this modern era. Uh, we came back and we saw that more and more the importance that presenting ourselves and getting ourselves, our peoples together as an indigenous nation. My name is Laura Villegas and I was born and raised in East LA. And um, I believe in the Tlaltocan for myself and for Chicano, Mexicano people because I see it as a survival and a way of life. For myself, my father was um, struggling his whole life for his future generation and I think in, in myself I also am struggling for the, my future generation and uh, I experienced a lot of, of unhappiness with my father becoming sick and, and almost losing his mind and who he was and his whole identity in terms of survival in, in this today world that we all live in and uh, the concept of Tlaltocan to me is uh, trying to build a better future, trying to make a way for ourselves to learn uh, self-sufficiency, to acquire land bases, and to develop our spirituality and the spirituality of our children and the future generations. There are many things that uh, still tie us to our past. One of these is our medicine. In our communities, there are many people who still practice the medicine that we once had before the Europeans came. And these uh, medicinal practices are in many ways far more advanced than uh, Western medicine. And also they, uh, in many cases, they can rival some of the uh, traditional medicines that are still around, like the Chinese, uh, for example. This uh, medicine that we still keep is, is very important to us. It's something that uh, ties us to, to our history, to our past, but it's also something of value that can help us move forward as a people. We only need to uh, put a proper worth on it, a proper value in our minds, and uh, not be ashamed of it. Uh, my name is Lee. Lee Polanco, and I'm from Big Spring, Texas. I reside at this time here at the Tohono Nation here, Covered Wells. And uh, we're going to be speaking about the peyote and, and how it's related to the Native American church uh, as it relates, as it pertains to, to the Chicano, to the Chicano people. And uh, the peyote, I believe, is pretty much common knowledge that the peyote came from what is now known as the south of the Mexican-U.S. border. There is some peyote uh, north of the border of Valerio, Texas. Uh, as I understand it, the peyote moved some south across the border, or at that time, maybe there wasn't even a border there a long time ago and uh, then it went up north into some of the northern states even into the eastern states they made it a loop or beyond over to northern Canada and uh, then back over to the west states of the United States and then south into the southwest and uh, somewhere along the way the the, the near American church uh, in the practice of peyote 